You know, throughout January, we've been tracking with this series idea, Always Only Jesus. And it kind of came from a, a central idea that as we start a new year, what could it look like to put Jesus first in every arena of our lives? Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you placed your faith in Jesus, then this becomes a really central question for your life. What does it mean now if I've decided to put Jesus first? And also, as we put Jesus first, we're also going to remember all of our children here in the service. And kids, we're going to be heading out for a program. There's going to be icy poles or ice creams, I believe. Where's my friend, Danny Aragoni? Big wave at the back, part of our kids team. If you're a, a kid here this morning, we've got an awesome program for you. If you've signed in, I believe that happened before the service started. But flow out with Danny. Is it, is it an icy pole or an ice cream? Both. Okay, so in that case, after the service, one icy pole, one ice cream for Phil, <laughs> if possible. <laughs> uh, but see you, kids. Have a great time in that program. Thank you, friends at the front, for reminding me of our next generation. Uh, so when we think about what it means to put Jesus first in our lives, it becomes a really important question. Now, if you're still exploring faith or still discovering what it means to follow Jesus, I really hope and pray that this morning there'd be something in God's Word that would help to create a bigger picture of what it means to follow Christ. But for those of us that have made that decision already, this question really does become one of the central questions of life. What does it mean to put Christ first? first. And this morning, we're going to go a little bit deeper with that idea, and a little bit more specific as well. Because one of the things that, that I've come to believe over the years, that essentially who I am, who you are, is massively shaped by the sum total of the decisions that you've made over time. Who would agree with that? That who you are as it stands today, one of the, the big influences that has helped bring shape and definition to who you are as a person is the choices that you've made over a period of time. So then one of the critical questions becomes, how do I begin to make Christ-centered choices and Christ-centered decisions? So our message title for today is simply going to be Christ-centered. When it comes to the kinds of choices that we're making, the kind of decisions that we're making, whether it be in daily rhythms or in those big climactic moments of choice in each of our lives. And as we lean into that idea, one of the things that, that I kind of become aware of is as we're approaching the various decisions of life, we run our choices through a certain set of filters. So we have an idea, and then we reflect on that idea, and it will run through some certain filters in our mind, and then ultimately we'll make a decision. Does that track with everyone so far? You're following at the Malalu campus, I haven't lost you, everyone online. That, that when we make a choice, it runs through some filters, and when it gets successfully through those filters, then we make our final decision. Now, I want to bring you an insight from the life of a teenage boy as we reflect on this idea. Now, if you've been excluded from uh, being a teenage boy, whether through gender or youth, let me give you an insight into the wonderful world of male adolescence. Does that sound fun for everyone? You're like, this could go in any number of different ways. But one of the things about teenage boys, as I remember it from that season of my life, that teenage boys like to jump from an elevation into various bodies of water. Does anyone remember doing that in your youth? And it's not exclusively a teenage boy thing, it's fun for the whole family as well. But I remember in particular when I was a kid, we lived in this awesome house uh, just down the road from our Mullaloo campus, and it had a swimming pool out the back. And it was actually a two-story house. And it was one of those houses where the second-story balcony was just like mwah, beautifully placed for a jump straight into the pool. Now, if you're a teenager, if you're of any age and you move into a house like that, who's jumping off that balcony? Come on, lots of hands. A few, I was hoping for slightly more. Michelle, would you jump off the balcony into a pool? You did. A, a cliff. Okay, that's good as well. And uh, so, so uh, immediately, me and my brother, all my friends, as we came over, would jump from the balcony into the pool, of course, when my parents weren't at home. Are my parents here in the room today? Super helpful. I can embellish this story a little more. And uh, so we'd jump off that balcony. And I remember one time jumping off that balcony, landing in the water, and looking up at where I just leapt from. And I noticed that even higher than the balcony of the second story was the roof of the whole house. And I looked up at that, and I thought, that's going to give me an extra three or four meters. And so I said, I'm going to jump off the whole roof of the house, still ideally, ideally located above the pool to jump straight down into the pool. Now, here's the decision. And the filters of a teenage boy, as I thought about that decision, that's higher. Is it going to be fun? Yes. There's decision-making filter number one. 
Now, is there an element of risk? Maybe a little, but not too bad. Tick. Off we go. And obviously, with age and wisdom, that filter grows and becomes, you know, a bit more wise. But I went up there. How funny is this? As I was reflecting on this moment so many years ago, I remember putting on a pair of shoes. I was like, yeah, this is pretty high. I should put on a pair of shoes because if anything goes wrong, I'll have my shoes on. How good is that? Like a 15-year-old me, yeah, I'm like eight meters in the air. If I miss the pool and land on the concrete, I've got my shoes on. I'm going to be okay. My legs aren't going to break. Everything's going to be fine. The brother's like, it's pretty high, man. You sure you want to do that? I've, I've got my shoes on. We're going to be fine. And, I, and I, actually, I went up there with my sneakers, and I jumped off. And as you can see, I'm still alive, which is nice. And, and actually, everything went fine. I almost overshot the pool. I remember, like, if you see this stage is the edge of the pool, I was kind of like, right on it as I landed. And everything was fine. But that's a little glimpse of the, the decision-making process of a teenage boy. It runs through a filter. I was like, fun, yes, dangerous, not too bad, yes, let's do this. But as we age and in different situations, our filters for decision-making become more and more complex. So then if we think about what it means to make Christ-centered decisions, I want to give you three little parameters here. Now, when we begin to make decisions... Where we begin is what I'm going to call this first filter. And sorry, JP, I might have danced around a bit. We're going to begin with self-interest. So this is the starting point as our filters for making a decision. We begin with self-interest. And we ask ourselves questions like, will this be good for me? Will this be fun for me? Will this improve the quality of, of my life in one way or another? And we make decisions always based on some degree of self-interest. But then as we grow and mature, we grow to increase and bring another filter in our decision-making process, which I'm going to call being others-focused. So we grow those muscles of empathy, and we become aware that as I make decisions, it has an impact on people around me. And we start to build in this new filter in our decision-making process to say, how will this impact the people in my world? How will this impact my family? How will this impact my workplace, my church community? How will it impact the larger community around me? And now we have this wonderful duality of self-interest and others focused. And then there's a wrestle between those things as we make our decisions. Is that resonating with anyone so far this morning? And then here's the next step that we can grow towards. So we go from self-interest to others focused. Others focused is a great place to be. But even beyond that, and this is the, the subject for our message this morning, is what does it mean to take the next step to grow towards being Christ-centered? Now, here's my belief around Christ-centered decision-makings, that if I'm making my decisions based on the person of Jesus and His kingdom principles, here's what I know about myself. It is actually looking after my own self-interest to put Jesus first in my life. Because Jesus actually has a plan for wholeness, fullness, life, beauty for me. And when I actually put Jesus first, I'm actually putting myself first. And then we can apply that same lens onto others. That when I begin to put Jesus first in my life, it's actually holistically better for everyone that's around me. When I put Jesus first in my life, I begin to be focused on speaking life, wholeness, and blessing over others. I begin to grow towards being a person of service and sacrifice. That when Christ becomes the center of my decision-making faculties, it's actually better for myself and everyone around me. Now, it's not always going to feel like that, but I believe that that's fundamentally true. That as we put Jesus first, it's better for me, it's better for those around me. You know, here's a picture from marriage. Anyone married here this morning? Anyone happily married? Yeah, that's a bit more enthusiastic. Anyone, you know, maybe one day you'd like to get married? Anyone at our Mullaloo campus, you're married, you'd like to get married? Maybe you're engaged right now. Congratulations to Daniel and Angie, or their uh, celebrity couple mashup name, Danji, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, they're, they're engaged. We're so happy for both of them. And one of the things with marriage, right, let's say... I, I'm married. I, I love being married. been married 14 years. Now, let's say I get married. And when I get married, I make a bunch of promises, kind of what, the, what scriptures would talk about as covenant promises. I say that no longer am I living my life for myself. I'm living my life for you, for us together as a unit. It's a central promise of marriage. So let's say I get married. I make that promise. And then I continue on making decisions as if I'm still single. 
What would happen to me? In trouble. Excellent point of reference. Thank you to Nick Aragoni, chef, man of wisdom. I love it. That my life is going to be in trouble. And here's why. Because I've made a covenant promise to make decisions inclusive of my wife's needs. Now, I'm making decisions after having made that promise based only on my own needs. So there is a disconnect between the covenant of my life and the way that I'm actually making my decisions. And when that happens, there's a brokenness in life that, of course, in the case of marriage, can come out in all kinds of ways. Now, let's layer our Christian faith over this same idea. If you're here this morning and you've made a decision to follow Jesus, you too have entered into a covenant relationship with God and Christ. You said that I have placed my faith in Jesus. I believe in the forgiveness of sins through the grace of the Son, through the the generosity and love of the Father. That I have decided to live my life saying Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Now, likewise, if I make that covenant promise of faith and receive the covenant blessings of God and then continue to live my life and make decisions as if I have no faith in Jesus, likewise... I have a problem because there's a disconnect between the covenant relationship that I've entered into with Christ and the way that I'm making decisions in my life. The call of discipleship is to say, I have decided to follow Jesus and now I will follow in his footsteps. I will make decisions based on the covenant relationship that I'm part of. That's what discipleship is. Now, I want to take us to a passage of scripture this morning that that some of you will be familiar with. And it's a passage of Scripture that I absolutely love. And I think it's a really helpful point of reference when we begin to ask ourselves this question. How do I grow to become a person that centers Jesus in my decision-making processes? How do I grow in ever-increasing ways to become that kind of follower of Jesus? Man, that's, that's my desire. That now my faith is in Christ, now I want to grow towards becoming a person that puts Jesus first in my decision-making. Let me take you to Romans 12 and verse 2. This is going to be a familiar passage for a lot of you, and I want you to, to, to bring the kind of idea and lens that we've been talking about straight into this Scripture. And the Apostle Paul says this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. I'm going to stop right there, just the first part of this verse for now. Don't be conformed to the patterns of the world, the patterns that you see around you, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, as I think about what Paul is saying here, and I reflect on what it means to actually align myself with the existing patterns of the world that's around me. Here's one way you could think about it. It's about saying, when it comes to the choices of my will in my life, and again, going back to that decision-making process, we have an idea, and then it runs through some filters. Now, the world around us will prescribe certain filters for the way that we make decision-making. It will prescribe certain things of value that says, as you're making your decisions, consider this. As you're making your decisions, consider that. Now, sometimes the patterns of the world can be pretty good. We can make decisions based on family, on relationships, on good life balance, on fun experiences. Sometimes the patterns of the world can be really damaging and really lead us to a point of self-interest. Think about yourself, think about your experiences, think how fun your life is, think how nice your car is, think how nice your house is, think how nice your experiences are. Sometimes it can be very damaging and lure us to that place of self-interest. But whether it's good or whether it's bad, the filters of the world are always less than who Jesus is. So when Paul says, don't conform to the patterns of the world, one of the things I think he's saying there is make decisions differently to those that don't know Jesus. To be transformed by the renewing of your mind, it comes to the place of will that now I'm actually going to think differently. I'm going to choose differently. I'm going to decide differently. There's going to be a deeper reservoir of wisdom in my life that comes from who Christ is. You know, when I think of that that picture of renewal, and renewal is such an important word for us here at True North and for the church in general, that, that renewal is such a powerful thing. And I think it comes down to two things, that if the renewal of God is going to be active in my life, it begins always with the outpouring and the indwelling of His Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ afforded to us through the cross 
that when we place our faith in Jesus, we have the profound opportunity to invite God's Holy Spirit into our life. That renewal is always supernatural. If we try to approach renewal in the, in the human soul as anything less than supernatural, we've missed the core of what it is. So it's inviting the renewing presence of God into our lives to miraculously transform our soul, our heart, our spirit, our being, our mind, our will, our decision making. That it's always going to begin with an outpouring of His Spirit. And if we try to just practically make changes to align our lives more with Christ and ignore the power of His Spirit, we're going to have a very hard time. But once we've received the renewing presence of the Spirit of God in, in our lives, there's another step for us, that now we need to apply the kingdom principles of Jesus, who the Spirit flows from, to the place of the human will. That now my decisions are shaped by Christ that's not out there somewhere, but Christ that is in me through the power of the Holy Spirit. So it begins with an outpouring of the Spirit of God, and it finds fulfillment when we actively choose to prioritize the kingdom principles of Jesus in our own lives. Is that tracking for everyone? Are we good at Malalu? Is Dean like, is he loving this message? I hope so. I really hope so. Someone give him a pat on the back. I love Dean. He's my pastor. I love him so much. So the kingdom principles of Christ are actively chosen. Renewal happens. Christ-centered decisions begin to flow. Let's take a look at the second part of this verse. So do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And then part B of this verse, and I love this, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect, to test and discern God's will. Let me give you a quick framework here. We'll have this up on the screen. To test and discern what God's will is. Firstly, we need to acknowledge that God actually does have a will for our life. Now, this step is a step of faith. It's to put faith in the reality that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Creator of the world, actually has an idea for you and how you live your life. That God actually has will for who you are. And the will that God has for you is actually abundantly good. This is the first step. A step of faith through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to recognize that the sovereign creator of the world actually not only has an interest in my life, but has design for my life and has a will for my life, has, a de, has an idea for how I would act in the day-to-day, -day, how I would act in the big moments. So it starts with this moment, placing your faith, or maybe for you this morning, renewing your faith in the reality that God actually has a will for your life. And then as we build from that, we put our faith in that reality. Perhaps the more important component now is to begin caring that He has a will for our life. To value God's will when it comes to who we are. If we circle back to that picture of marriage, that we recognize that when we're married now, we're living life with someone else and, and what they like, their preferences, it actually really matters. And if we act like it doesn't matter, again, we're going to have a problem. Likewise with God, when we place our faith in Him and say, God has a will for my life, and I need to learn to value that reality, to actually value becoming a person that forms more and more into the person of who Jesus is, that God has a will for my life, and that's deeply significant to me. And so as we get to that decision-making process, that one of those filters becomes God's will for my life. How good is that, to build that into the process of becoming into our lives as disciples? What is God's will for my life? And that's a tough question to ask, which is why we need to test and discern to find out what God's perfect and pleasing will is for each one of us. And then finally, we need to pursue His will for our lives. It begins with faith that God has a picture for who I'm becoming. It begins with a heart and a refined value system that says, I care deeply about God's will for my life. And then it's about a commitment of action to say, I will pursue God's will for my life. I will test. I will discern. I will wrestle through to discover what God is speaking to me in my life in the day to day. To discover the will of God. And that's where, renew that's where renewal happens, through this kind of a process. 
So ultimately, how do we get there? How do we take all of this and actually build blocks of formation in our own lives, in our own sense of becoming more like Christ? You know, I think it's helpful just for a moment to reflect on this idea of discernment that Paul uses in the second part of this verse. Uh, And sometimes when we hear that word discernment, we can attach different things to it, particularly if you've been in church for a long time. Now, one of the things that might come to mind is the spiritual gift of discernment as talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, as Paul lists these varying gifts from the Spirit for the common good of the body of Christ. And one of those is the gift of discernment, or as he calls it, the distinguishing between different kinds of spirits. And in that context, it's about being a person that's able to discern and distinguish between what is is the leading of the Holy Spirit of God, and what is the leading of any lesser spirit or human idea that is less and in opposition to God. So it's about distinguishing the Spirit of God against anything that is less than the Spirit of God. Discerning the Spirit of God against anything that is in opposition to the Spirit of God. So that's one specific example of discernment. But Paul here in Romans chapter 12, I think he's using a more broad definition of what discernment is. And as a follower of Jesus, as a disciple, to discern holistically what is God's will for my life? What does God have for me? Uniquely expressed in the context of an individual day and also expressed in the process of becoming of a lifetime. What does God have for my life? And here in Romans, I think it's more of this expression of discernment. Now, I want to finish by giving us four process tools to wrestle through this process of discernment. What is God's will for my life? To become a person of discernment, there's some things that we can do. And I'm going to frame these as Christ-centered decisions. If we want to make Christ-centered decisions, I want to give you four blocks that you can build into your life this morning. And remembering, though, remembering that this all begins with an outpouring of His Spirit. We're going to pray for that a little bit later. But here's four blocks that we can begin to build into our lives. And here's the first one when it comes to Christ-centered decisions is that Christ-centered decisions flow from a Christ-centered foundation. Now, here's one of the the pictures of of decision-making when it comes to seeking God's will, seeking God's voice, is that one of the things that that I know I've typically done from time to time, and maybe it will resonate with you in your own journeys of faith, is that sometimes we wait for those big climactic moments of life to begin including God in the decision-making process. Does that resonate with anyone? It's like when I'm thinking about a change of career, okay, now I need to seek God. When I'm thinking about, should we have another child? Okay, now it's time to seek God. When we're thinking about maybe changing states or countries, perhaps less of a reality at the moment, but when we're thinking about those kind of big, life-changing, climactic moments, then we say, God, speak. And for me, it's kind of like pursuing the will of God in the clutch moments of life. Anyone, Anyone heard that word clutch before? Here's here's the idea behind a clutch moment. Often we talk about it in the athletic world, in the sporting world, that when a game is on the line, when it's completely tied up, and then an athlete delivers in the clutch, it's saying that that particular athlete is able able to produce in that high-stress moment when the game's on the line and do what they need to do to win the game. That's a clutch moment. And certain athletes just have this knack of delivering in those moments. But the reality is, all of those athletes that we sometimes talk about, yeah, they're huge in the clutch. They're huge in the clutch. You know why they're huge in the clutch? Because they've done that exact same skill a thousand times in the gym by themselves. And now all it's about doing is about taking what I've done in the private and then applying it to this clutch moment. Now, when it comes to discerning the will of God... I know that more and more I need to grow to become a person that seeks God daily. So there's a deeper reservoir reservoir of His Spirit within me to draw on. And when you include God daily in your life, it is far easier to make Christ-centered decisions daily. And when you get to those big moments where there's a massive battle between being self-interest, others-focused, Christ-centered, it is so much easier to discern the small, still voice of God when there's a foundation of Christhood in our lives. So my first encouragement is don't wait for the clutch moments of life to cry out to God. Include Him in your life daily, and He will be there in those clutch moments. 
and you will hear and perceive His voice, untangling it from your own, untangling it from anything else, because it's something you just live in every day. And in the big moments, you just draw on what's already there, the Spirit of God living and active in your life. Here's the next step. And I'm, I'm such a fan of this one. I've been personally blessed by it recently. Is that Christ-centered decisions hold up to wise counsel. You know, Proverbs 12 talks about a, a fool seeks his own path, but a wise person seeks the counsel of others. That there's this sense that, that when it comes to perceiving the will of God in our lives, that so often... God speaks through men and women of wisdom that are around us. You see this, in, this pattern all through Scripture. I've seen this pattern in my life time and time again, is that God does things through other believers. That's why the church exists, because as we gather together and God uses all of our shared gifts for the, the overall good of the body of Christ and the world that we're a part of, that we speak that life and blessing over each other. So who in your life, is your wise counsel. Here's some points of reference. Because all the time, we're looking to voices to have an influence in our decision-making process. We do it without even realizing. So we need to be intentional about saying, okay, who are the wise people of faith that can affirm and confirm the Spirit's leading in my life? Here are the things that you want to look for. People that love Jesus more than anything else. People who have an evidence of following Jesus and making Christ-centered decisions. Here's another good one. Not always, but I think this is a really helpful one. People who have followed Jesus for longer than you have. And people that care deeply about who you are. You find someone like that and you say, hey, here's what I'm wrestling through. I feel like God's speaking this into my life, but I just want to make sure it's His voice and not my own ideas or someone else's idea of what I should be like. You know, as Michelle said, in a couple of weeks, I'll be finishing my time on staff here at True North, and, uh, and there'll be lifelong friendships with, with our church here at True North for the rest of my life, and I'm so grateful for that. But in a staff capacity, I've got just a couple of weeks left here, and for me, that was one of the most difficult decisions I've ever processed in my life. I felt a deep sense of God's call in the direction that I ultimately chose. But before I got there, I had four conversations with four men of faith. And with each one of them, I asked them questions. I asked them questions about my own motivations. I asked them questions about what they thought about that trajectory of my life if they had any checks in their heart, any checks in their spirit. And I'm so grateful. I just want to take a moment to honor those men. Again, my pastor, Dean, Brian Smythe, one of our elders here, my dad, and my brother. And through all four of those conversations, as we processed those heart checks, as, I, as we processed together those things of self, and ultimately I was able to land through the Spirit's leading initially, confirmed by wise counsel, that that was the right step for my life. So my encouragement to you is to identify people of wise counsel in your life. You know, here's the thing, and we forget this so often, we don't actually have to discern the voice of God alone. Did you know that? When you feel God speaking in your life, you don't have to discern that by yourself. Seek voices of wisdom that can help you refine and clarify the leading of God in your life. Last couple, really quick. That as you're processing decisions, and we've talked about this already, but ruthlessly identify your own self-interest. Ruthlessly identify your own self-interest. As you're processing decisions, what about self is clouding the issue here? And even if you're making a decision based on self, and sometimes we absolutely need to do that, you need to be very aware of what you're doing. And you need to wisely test what you're doing through great conversation, through that process of discernment, to say, God, if you're in this, I need to talk through this issue in my own life. I remember sitting with Brian and saying, Brian, I want to make sure that there's nothing in me that's being driven by ego as I make this choice. And I said, do you see any of that in me? 
And we talked about that. We processed that. And even giving voice to that and me ruthlessly identifying that as a possible motivation helped me to refine that that wasn't what was leading me. But we need to be ruthless about sometimes our frailty as human beings and the things that can motivate us. To identify your own self-interest, to become better and better at doing that. Because one of the central tasks we have, mostly when we're discerning God's voice, is to untangle ourself from the voice of God. What's my motivations wrapped up in all of this? And what is the Spirit's leading? Conversations are a great way to engage with that process. And the final piece, I, I'm sorry, everyone at Malalu, I've gone a little bit over. And the final piece is to identify any external values that are competing with Christhood in your life. And that can come from a number of sources. That can come from close relationships that don't have a framework for faith in Jesus. That can come from family relationships that don't have a context of faith in Christ. It can come from the, as Paul began, do not conform with the patterns of this world. It can come from simply the basic patterns of what it means to live in Perth, Western Australia. Identify what are the external influences, the external voices that are less than and competing with the voice of Christ in your life. Be able to name them. And then you can clearly identify, okay, what's my self-interest? What are some other voices that are perhaps influencing how I'm feeling, what I'm leaning towards? And then ultimately, what is the voice of Christ speaking? And when you can identify those things clearly, you're much better positioned to discern God's leading in any particular moment in your life. You know, I want to finish with, with this idea. I'm going to invite the, the team to come and join us. It was great for a second. I thought Michelle was going to come up and lead us into worship. She's like, oh, here we go. <laughs> I would have loved that, incidentally. Uh, but we're going to sing another song. Hey, Josie. And we're going to sing another, another song together. And as we do, I want to take us back to the starting point for renewal. We've just spent a bit of time talking about, okay, what are some practical blocks of formation that we can actually build into our lives? But the thing that, that's so critical here, we can't move to that point of application and start thinking, I need to have great conversations with wise people. I, I need to identify my own self-interest. I need to identify what these other voices are. None of that stuff works if you don't first invite the Spirit of God into your life. Say, God, lead me. Bring shape to me. Bring definition to me. And this morning, I want to invite you to be a part of a prayer, that there'd be a renewing sense of the Spirit of God in your life, indwelling, leading, refining, renewing, and so that Jesus, in growing ways, could be the center of who you are, the center of how you respond to things, the center of the decisions that you make, it begins with the rejuvenating presence and power of God within. And I just want to pray that over us this morning. So I want to invite, if you're at Mullaloo and here at Merrill, can we all stand together? If you're, you're joining us online from anywhere, I want to invite you to stand as well. And in particular, in this holy moment, you know, I think it's such a powerful thing to recognize when you're a part of a holy moment. And by faith, I believe that's what this is, that this is a shared holy moment in a couple of different rooms, maybe lots of different rooms for all the people online, that this is a shared holy moment. And that if you want to take the step to become a Christ-centered person, I want to invite the Spirit of God to powerfully come upon your life, to begin a renewing work of transformation. And if that's you this morning, in this moment, I'll invite you just to close your eyes. If that's you, I just want to invite you to, to lift both of your hands before God. I'm a big believer in these physical, symbolic expressions of desire for God. So if you're at home, if you're at Malaloo, just raise those hands before God. And receive this prayer of blessing. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are here. I thank you that you are here at Meroa. You are here at Malalu. You are here in every other space that people receive this prayer. And Holy Spirit, I pray that in this moment, 
you would anoint deeply. Jesus, I pray that your spirit would run deep to the place of the soul for every person with arms outstretched to you. Jesus, I pray that for every person with their hands raised, their Christianity would be radically transformed in this moment. Jesus, I pray that they would become aware like a fresh fire of the covenant relationship that they have made with you, Christ, to follow you, to live for you, to live in your grace, to live in your wholeness. And Jesus, I pray that in ever-increasing ways, there would be an evidence of Christhood in their life. Jesus, I pray that you would pour out a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit in their life, even in this moment, Lord. Jesus, I pray that there would be incredible increase. Jesus, I pray for this community of people. God, I pray that you would pour out your Spirit. You might be standing nearby someone with their arms outstretched. If you know them, just place a hand on them and begin to pray. Jesus, I pray that there would be a greater outpouring of your Spirit, that there would be a greater evidence of your Spirit. Jesus, that you would break down the things that separate us from your call, from your will, from your leading. Holy Spirit, bring increase. And Jesus, I pray as they build new rhythms into their life, as they build new things into their life, that it will be sustained by the renewing work of your Spirit. Jesus, I ask for increase. Jesus, I ask for more. God, I pray that True North would continue to be a Christ-centered church. Jesus, that this would be a church centered on you, that this would be a people centered in you. Holy Spirit, bring more. We praise you, God. We're going to sing together. And I want you to hold on to the holiness of this moment. And if you want someone to pray for you specifically, I want to invite you during this next song, if you're here at Merowa to come to the front, Michelle, other pastors and elders would love to pray for you. I'd love to pray for you. If you're at Mullaloo, please, actually, I'm not sure what's happening next at Mullaloo, but find someone to pray with. If it's a song, find Dean, find someone to pray for you. If you're at home with family, pray for one another. But let's capture this holy moment. And if you feel specifically the Holy Spirit needs to do some deeper work in your life, come and let someone pray into your life. And we're going to worship our God together. Let's praise Him.